others um, also do their part. He said the big elephant in the room is China, and China indeed is the largest creditor to Ghana. And so far, it appears to him that China is not supportive of setting up uh, a creditors committee where creditors will sit uh, and agree on an aid package for Ghana. Uh, we've been joined on the line by Professor uh, Godfrey Bokping of the University of Ghana. He understands these matters to help us uh, appreciate uh, the, the matters properly. Uh, he's an economist with the University of Ghana. Hello, good evening, sir. Welcome to Eyewitness News. Th these are interesting times, really. Uh, you know, how big, really, is Ghana's indebtedness to China? For the German ambassador, for example, to say that if China is not ready to come to the table, then they cannot also do much. Good evening, and good evening to our cherished uh, listeners. Well, um, and thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, China is a big player. Um, in the last 20 years, or a little more than that, the Paris club creditors, essentially talking about Germany, France, Japan, US, UK, and the rest of them, actually, they are developmental assistance to Ghana and Africa for that matter, has been dwindling, been going down. At a time when Africa needed the Paris club creditors the most, they were organizing sending off parties for themselves. Then China stepped up to the plate and took up the challenge. So if you look at the developmental footprint of China on the continent, and Ghana for that matter, relative to the Paris club creditors, including Germany, you will see that China is a big player on the continent. And therefore, their cooperation or involvement is key. But then, if you look at Ghana's indebtedness to China, the external debt from the current composition dimension, it's not so big. It's not so big so as to say that if we fail to receive debt forgiveness from China, that is the end for Ghana. No. Okay, valued slightly above around 4% of our total external debt, or put it roughly maybe around $1.7 billion, or even a little more than that. You know, this is not extraordinary. But then, if you look at that amount relative to the Paris club creditors made up of these powerful countries, Germany, Japan, um, UK, France, U.S. and the rest of them, you can see that China is a big player as a single country. And their level of exposure to Ghana. Now, and that is why, if that is why we need a proper strategy in getting China to cooperate. And I, I think that, hello? Yes, go ahead. I think that the current discussion and approach put China in a certain bad light, which I think is not good totally, which may also be, 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 be fueled by the global geopolitics as elevated by the Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's posture and then also Ghana's posture with respect to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, because Ghana is leaning more towards the West and all of that. So that already will send some signal. And all of, so we have to find a, a, a better way of cooperating along this line than probably maybe blaming everything on China. China needs to be treated with respect. Of course, the uh, developmental footprint on the continent is also driven by self-interest. And that will not be strange. Look, if you look at the data, any country that has developed largely from the global north, at one point in time or the other, used Africa as a footprint in terms of 
access to cheap raw materials. Cheap raw materials, cheap labor in the form of slave trade. Access to cheap raw materials, cheap gold, diamond, oil, and all of that. So if you look at the partition of Africa, the scramble for Africa, it was not for really our own human development, but it was more for their interest. Okay? So, so the literature is clear. China would have also seen that, that in order to, 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 to fast track their developmental outcome, they cannot do so without Africa. And that is why they are also here. Unfortunately, in all of these things, Africa doesn't seem to have a clear strategy for engaging these development partners. And therefore, we are unable to negotiate from position of strength because we clearly don't have underlying strategy that we, we, we are engaging them with. But should, 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 it be a, uh, should it be a negotiation on block or everybody you know, deals with the, the, the creditors you know, according to their problems, you know, should it be on block or everybody should just approach their creditors uh, uh, based on their peculiar challenges? That could have been one approach, right? But as we speak right now, and as the German ambassador said, there is a framework. Of course, they have so many issues. We've, we've seen the G20 framework. We've seen how in the case of Zambia, it has not delivered efficiently and timely and all of that. But of course, but look at it this way. It may be easier for China, it may be easier for Japan, Germany, US, UK to come under that framework and say that, look, let's forgive because they have little to forgive. It may not be the same for China to come and say, okay, let's forgive because they have so much to forgive in relative terms. Okay. Mm. So the so the dynamics are not the same. But they may not forgive everything. They could say they are forgiving twenty percent or fifty percent, or they could restructure altogether. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that let's find a better approach so that what is happening in Ghana specific instance does not play out significantly into the global geopolitics that is going on right now mm. between the West and then the East. Uh, Russia, Ukraine. Uh, Russia, China, Russia, India China, yes. on the other side. I, I, and I now you can see that Africa itself, to some extent, is divided. Mm. Okay, there are some powerful countries on the continent that are leaning more towards Russia, China, India. So you see the, the voting pattern recently. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that we, as a country, we need to find a better diplomatic way of managing this whole thing so that it doesn't play so much into the hands of one of these powerful blocks in a way that uh, uh, would compromise our own long-term interest. So we need to be strategic from that angle. And, and, and so if you see part of the statement and all of that going on, and the fact that China probably may be thinking of having a different approach rather than the G20 common framework, all of this may also be fueled by the ongoing global geopolitics. Remember, at that level, it matters most to them. And mm. you can see it also in terms of how Ghana had also sought to play its part in feeding into this global geopolitics in aligning a bit excessively with the West. Okay? And, 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 and probably, and, and I'll tell you already, that might have been yielding some results because mm. my considered view is that if you look at the speed with which the, the mission chief, the mission team that came to Ghana reached the staff level agreement in a record time, I believe that there might have been some measured pressure from the West. And if you look at the discussion, how it has been elevated, and now it's, on, it's not even an AOB, it's an agenda item on the, on the IMS managing director and all of that, and Ghana is more or less mentioned every now and then, you could see that all this global geopolitics and all of that are all playing out. We need to manage that carefully. I because see. We do, in addition to looking at the short-term gains in terms of having an IMF program, we should be looking at the long-term strategic stance of the country relative to these powerful blocks.
it's, 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 interesting, it's, it's interesting that the point you made about Ghana's position shifting, especially the, the, the recent vote, and, and coupling that with the president's recent remarks on the Wagner group of Burkina mm -hmm. Faso when he met the, the, the U.S. officials. That, that actually you know, points to a certain direction, but that's fine. But you know, what, what really do, it, do, do you think may be happening? Uh, the finance minister also lead a team to China. Now, China says that they cannot meet us until late March because they are having their party congress or conference for the whole of the period. Now, the IMF board, we understand, will meet in early or mid-March. What happens? Because our debt with China may not be restructured, or the discussion may not even have reached any fruitful point, and now the IMF board will be meeting. Can the IMF board meet and still consider Ghana without the, the debt to China being restructured? In fact, that is where the global geopolitics becomes critical now, right? And I think that the IMF, the key shareholders, essentially U.S., and the rest of them must use their influence positively so that it, it doesn't create or create a certain bad impression on, 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 on China, which, which can, can affect our relationship with China and, and, and uh, beyond the IMF program. And I think we should be looking at it from that perspective. Um, the reason China's cooperation, and I think that we should not isolate them. And the reason I'm saying so is that if you look at the existing debt composition, how much we owe China, it's not an outlier. It's not so big, but we need something more from China and our bilateral creditors beyond how much we owe them now. And I will explain it in this form. You know, the 2023 budget has a huge budget deficit in excess of um, 30 billion CDs. Now, in terms of financing that one alone, and now you understand why the German ambassador is also talking about the size of government, right? Mm -hmm. Well, expenditure card. I'll tell you why that is important. Now, if you look at the budget alone, it has a huge deficit. The deficit explains the borrowing requirement of the government. And that is why we say that fiscal unsustainability is intricately linked to debt on sustainability. So the fiscal deficit itself has to be financed. Now, Ghana has lost market assets from the international capital market. From the domestic market in terms of the medium to the long-term end of the market, Ghana has been priced out. So it means that beyond the discussion of existing debt restructuring, we need assurance from these bilateral creditors and multilateral partners that they will continue to fund or close the funding gap. That's why it's important. So the kind of assurance we want from China, Germany, US, UK, I mean, essentially, let me summarize it this way. Paris club creditors and non-Paris club creditors is beyond just our existing debt. Very well. We want assurance that they will continue to fund. And then also the other thing is that, look at the IMF program. Um, of course, it's not yet out, but mm. we, can, we can make an intelligent guess. Yeah, if in, in cost, a few seconds, yes. Yeah, if you cost the IMF program, you will need more than the $3 billion in order to implement the program. So which means that the IMF itself is unable to provide all the funding. And therefore, before the program is approved, they will need assurance from uh, uh, bilateral creditors and multilateral. Of course, they will also reach out to the assistant institution, the World Bank, and the others to come on board in providing the, the much-needed financing beyond the $3 billion the IMF will provide over the three-year period. So we need assurance that they will continue to support and fund the program and close the funding gap in addition to restructuring the existing debt. So that is how come the, uh, China's discussion should be looked at in, in beyond just how much we owe them now. I see. Thank you so much, Professor Godfrey Bapin. Always a pleasure speaking to you on these matters. It's with the University of Econ Economics and Economics with the University of Ghana. Eyewitness News on 97.3 City FM. Uh, your messages have been coming through.